Okay, great. So, uh, hello everybody and welcome. My name is Ariana. Uh, the next talk, what we're all here uh, to listen to is from Kirsty Faley. I knew you were trouble, a lesson in hypothesis and threat hunting. Uh, I'm so glad that you're with us here at the 2021 Diana Initiative Virtual Conference. For those of you on the socials, we are hashtag TDI2021 and hashtag spark a journey. So our next expert is incident responder gigs, as in a gigabyte with a Swift-esque take on hypothesis and threat hunting. But first, we have a very short note from our sponsors. Oh dear, excuse me. I can't seem to share my screen uh, to show you the sponsor list. I'm really sorry. Uh, so tech team, is there anything we can do or have I just messed that up entirely? Yeah, I've messed that up entirely. Okay, our sponsors, MongoDB, Juniper Networks, Corelight, Google, Bridge Crew, We Hack Purple, Axonius, uh, and Elon Security. Thank you so much to our sponsors. Thank you very much indeed. Let's move on very quickly. So our expert is Instant Responder Gigs, and we have a jam-packed uh, talk for you today. Before I let Kirsty go on with her talk, I'd like to just draw your attention to our Capture the Flag event. It runs over the entire two days with challenges ranging from easy uh, to, to a little bit harder for those of you who love puzzles. So stop over in our other sessions areas and the expo. But uh, enough of that, Move on. moving on to our main event. Uh, so just a note on questions, we've got, a, we've got some time at the end. But if you do have any questions, post them in the chat and I'll pass them, I'll pass them through to Kirsty. Uh, if we run out of time today, do not worry because these will be answered on Twitter. So that's that's all from me today. Without any further ado, it is my pleasure, it is my absolute joy to introduce you to Kirsty Faley. Uh, a round of digital applause, please. Uh, Kirsty, take it away. Thank you so much. All right. So my screen is up. Perfect. All right. Hey, what's up, friends, Swifties, and threat hunters alike? Thank you so much for joining my talk, I Knew You Were Trouble, a lesson in hypothesis and threat hunting. Today, I have a lot to cover. Are you ready for it? Maybe? OK, there you go. My name is Gracie Faley. I'm a senior incident response consultant at Mandiant. And um, I love, love threat hunting and finding evil. Oh, hold up. Oh. As you can probably tell by my title, I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan. Uh, throughout this talk, you will come to find a number of Easter eggs that I've carefully woven into the fabric of my content. Keep track of them. And the person with the closest uh, at the end of the next week, uh, yeah, next week, will be getting some swag from me. I'm a proud dog mama to my main guide, Knox. You can find pictures of him and his sassy personality on Twitter. Uh, so make sure you're following me or hit me up in Slack uh, with the final number for those Easter eggs for the chance to get some uh, Mandiant swag. Now, Taylor Swift and threat hunting. If you're not a Swifty, you're probably thinking, what the heck? Uh, so. Taylor Swift, very early on in her career, started to create this amazing relationship with her fan base through the use of secret messages and Easter eggs in the lyrics of her songs and the visuals in her music videos. As her career developed, so did the attention of people throughout the world to know everything about her, which <laughs> led to some wild rumors and stories being created about her. Taylor Swift fans and, uh, or I guess Swifties as we like to be called, saw that haters were gonna hate and became digital detectives to read through all of this nonsense reporting in the hopes of finding the true message that Miss Taylor Swift intended for all of her Easter eggs. Now, um, this isn't an isolated scenario to the Taylor Swift fan base. So, Everyone can probably imagine that over time and with the power of the internet, the narratives began to change and be pulled apart and blown way out of proportion. So how do you read through the nonsense and the level of and get a level of comfort uh, to be able to pick out the truth in all of this crazy nonsense? 
Well, that's where a bit of critical thinking, hypothesis generation, and data gathering, and basically understanding just how far into Wonderland you can dive is going to take you a really long way. So what does threat hunting really have to do with Miss Taylor Swift? Well, threat hunting is so much fun, but it can be very costly for your organization if you don't have your hypotheses in order. You know, um, you have to figure out when to call it a day. Something that over the past 15 years, I have learned so much from the Swifties. Um, I wanna share today with you some tips and tricks that uh, I have gathered from them, as well as over my career as an incident responder and threat hunter. So let's go ahead and dive into the details that you'll need to know about Miss Taylor Swift. So uh, Taylor Swift and her fans refer to each album cycle as an era. This allows Taylor to create worlds within her music and then uh, it allows her fans to better relate to it and it also opens up creativity for her fans. Um, and uh, Taylor leverages that to leave behind a lot of Easter eggs. Now, in her first five studio albums, Taylor incorporated secret messages in the lyric booklets of each physical album. All of the letters would be lowercase except for the secret messages, um, which would ultimately spell out a message or a word that would add additional meaning into the song. Now, in her sixth studio album, uh, she let the music and the clues in the lyrics of her songs do the talking. Famously saying, there will be no there will be no explanation, there will only be reputation. This is very important for our story because Reputation was the first album that directly pointed to public situations that was pretty clear to Swifties, which hater she was poking fun at and which relationship she was talking about. Taylor didn't participate in any marketing or promotion events for this album cycle that she did not arrange or control. Everything was, by design, a conversation where she was speaking directly to her fans through her music. Now, this all started to change when 2018's highest grossing stadium tour for the Reputation era came to an end. Oop, there we go. Taylor began transitioning her social media accounts from the dark snake filled reputation theme all the way to this bright and sparkly butterfly filled era of TS7. Taylor Swift seems to always be thinking a couple steps ahead of her fans, keeping a tight handle on any upcoming events or future song releases. And this sometimes uh, leads to some interesting theories from fans. This gradual thematic change to a lighter, more whimsical social media feed made her fans get a little carried away. There we go. <laughs> because of this dramatic social media comeback that Taylor Swift had in 2017, as the main marketing event that showcased that she was completely rewriting her reputation, uh, her fans got a little carried away. Her fans began hyper-analyzing every aspect of her social media presence. Um, and I guess as a global pop star, this is kind of part of the territory. And oh, did her fans have a blast and spend way too much time trying to figure out what was going on. So this brings us back to the main topic that sparked my idea for this talk. Now, this picture is iconic for the Swifty fandom. Um, but it may uh, confuse the rest of you. But it was really a turning point in the fandom. The five holes in the fence picture that you see on the screen where Taylor Swift is pictured looking through the center of a lattice fence with five associated holes was posted by Miss Taylor Swift after posting some seemingly countdown-esque type pictures on her Instagram. First, we see this, these seven trees. Then we see her on the sixth step. So naturally, five holes in the fence makes sense, right? Five days until something is going to happen. <laughs> well, wrong. Uh, so Taylor Swift posted these pictures well before she had even announced this, a single even um, for TS7. Uh, so 
she didn't even release the name of the album yet. This reaction got turned into memes and is still used to this day as a way to measure the likelihood of a new theory being true within the fandom. So what can we use this fast paced growth and curiosity to teach us about building theories and creating hypotheses? Well, data uh, or interrogated data will generally tell you anything you want it to because data can easily be manipulated to paint any type of picture you want. This is where your th critical thinking comes in. When it comes to threat hunting, there are a number of ways to get the right answer, right? Um, it, it's just a matter of how you ask the question. The process of validating that you have the right data, and then of course, having this level mindset of realistically understanding what the outcome is most likely going to be, um, is going to just carry you through your threat hunting process. Generating this open and uh, this open-ended question and having the right data um, and knowing what your data looks like within your environment will lead you down some pretty great hunts that will ultimately lead you, lead you in creating better detections, which then in turn will give you better visibility into your environment. So when we're talking about Taylor Swift, we will never understand exactly what her reasoning was at the time of each cryptic post until she confirms it or she makes fun of us for it. Like when she posted the same picture that caused her fans to spiral five days before the album dropped. As you can see in this picture, she recognized that this was such a big deal for the Swifties. She needed to make sure that she knew uh, that we all knew that she saw us climbing around. So when you are the threat hunter in your own environment though, you have a little bit more control uh, in figuring out where you're falling, falling into a rabbit hole or if you're on to creating this next big detection or maybe finding a new supply chain attack. When you start threat hunting, the short term goal is to get to know your environment really, really well. My tips uh, for starting is to basically identify that uh, basically identify areas that you have limited visibility into, and then find ways to get more data points surrounding that. Let's start by breaking those down into three buckets. First, we'll talk about endpoint, then you have your network areas, and then finally cloud. We'll start with these three. The idea here is to capture the main data points that could possibly tell us about what users are, what users are doing within each environment um, and Later, it will tell us whether or not it's a legit user or a nefarious one. We'll start with these buckets, uh, and later down the line, we can break them out into sub areas or even find additional areas to add buckets for. For example, data for endpoint will likely come from uh, endpoint detection tools like EDR, uh, EDR technologies or endpoint detection and response capabilities. Um, antivirus tools within the environment, asset management, or even software deployment tools. Next, we have network data points. You can pull from things like VPN, uh, firewall data to see bytes going in and out, um, and if they're consistent and timed network communication, sourcing from an internal system to an external infrastructure to uh, an environment that is consistent with something like malware beaconing or even looking at proxy data to see what type of internet traffic is occurring and what is getting blocked or maybe what should be getting blocked. Now, don't forget about cloud, right? As we're moving to more cloud-based services, it's always important to know what type of logging is available to pull from, as well as understanding the different types of license agreements that are in place for each services. They are not all created uh, equal. Uh, now, I don't have enough time for this talk specifically to dive into cloud specific hunts, but maybe next time. Uh, so now I just wanna tell you that these are the main buckets of data sources that we'll be using during this talk to uh, talk through the gathering of data. And uh, that brings me to why do we even need to consider the data first before we create the hypothesis? Um, so let's just go ahead and recap real quick. Um, we've been talking about how Swifties use uh, info Taylor Swift has given us. I've highlighted some pretty funny Swifty theories, or at least I think so. Um, and then we touched on some data sources that you can pull from to get answers for the questions that you want to ask of the data within your environment. So let's go ahead and dive into the ways that we can generate some great hunts. So 
when you're hunting, you never really want to find um, evil within your environment, but uh, it's really hard to prove a negative. So uh, what we want is to build uh, build hunts off of actionable intel, uh, but also with the main motivation uh, of looking through all of the data that we have access to within the environment uh, to see where we're lacking visibility so that we can make future hunts a little bit better and a little bit quicker and maybe a little bit more automated. So first, I, you are probably thinking, okay, but how do I confirm that I have visibility into the network if I'm not an expert in all things like systems administration or incident response and forensics or even red teaming, right? Well, a great way uh, we can kind of get into a threat actor's head is by looking at open source intelligence and public threat briefings that highlight what the attackers are up to, right? Keep up to date with the major threat reports that come out every year. Uh, so for instance, the Mandiant M trends or the CrowdStrike global threat report, or maybe even the Verizon's DBIR, just to name a few. These provide a great metric and a lot of fantastic predictions of what is likely to come based off of what each company has seen the year previous. So now, um, if you're looking for something that is a little bit more actionable uh, to work through while you're while each of those companies are building out their yearly reports, keep an eye on Twitter or threat blogs to watch out for the next big thing. I mean, 2021 has been filled with a number of network appliance zero days and supply chain-esque attacks that have been stretching us incident responders and security teams pretty thin. There's a lot of resources that you can pull indicators to hunt for, a lot of stuff that is really actionable. So when we're leveraging all of this information to create a multifaceted question, we need to make sure that we have access into the data within our environment. Um, this can help you stay one step ahead of the malicious actors that one day will probably find their way into your network. Uh, and at this point, hopefully, after this talk, you'll go back and make sure that you have detections on everything. So this brings me to this slide. Uh, we have to talk about how to take that open source research and turn it into something actionable. And that brings us to why attribution matters. We've come a really long way as a community when it comes to attribution. And believe me, we have much further to go. But um, it is really important as a defender to understand why attribution matters. Um, and honestly, as an incident responder myself, I'm not going to try to uh, attribute any threat group or even create threat groups, mostly because I just don't have that visibility. But I leverage all of that attribution every day when I'm responding to incidents. And here's why. Attribution can really tell us what the outcome of the incident probably would be or is intended to be. Uh, and it can help me understand, you know, where, uh, where to look, where to start when I'm trying to make sure that my network is, uh, is defended against those imminent threats. So I keep the following questions in mind whenever I read a threat report, uh, because it helps me craft my, um, my hunts. So first is, do, did the, uh, did the person who wrote this blog or the uh, threat report attribute this threat actor to a specific region, a specific threat group that's already known, um, and uh, outline what the ramifications and what they're what they're generally after? Next, um, we see when did this threat actor start or end this campaign that they're reporting on, or is it still an ongoing? Uh, incident, right? Then we have what was the intended outcome? Um, this goes along with the who. Um, it was a data theft. Was it disruption? Was it just monetary based, right? Uh, and then that follows on with could there be any other motivations behind the campaign? Something like espionage or political interference or advantage, um, or was it just purely a nuisance uh, type uh, attack? And then we have, is the threat actor targeting something specific, right? Are they targeting a specific geo uh, geography, uh, 
geographic lo uh, location or uh, a group or, or like a group of people or an industry specifically, right? This will help us understand what our hunts are supposed to look like um, and what speed we need to get them out and make sure that we have detections against. And last but certainly not least, how is the campaign being carried out? As you're reading um, a new threat report, think about all of these different questions in the back of your mind. Um, like I mentioned, it's going to help you create your hypotheses for hunting and a, a tr uh, figure out how much uh, people power you need to put behind it. So actionable attribution gives us a quicker way to respond and move quickly as the situation changes and we find new data that can either strengthen or hinder our case uh, for the initial response, uh, our initial hunt. So this all starts with our ability to get info on the campaigns and the threat groups. So <laughs> now understand, just before you jump to conclusions, uh, sometimes bad threat group names happen. Uh, it's okay, really, I promise. Just remember that tools do not make a threat group, okay? Um, it can be really confusing as a defender for a number of reasons when this happens, um, because honestly, threat actors use tools to complete missions, right? As folks that are um, involved with naming threat groups, uh, we have to remember that when we name newly attributed groups after the tools that they that we're observing them using, we make it more confusing for uh, defenders as the group evolves, right? We have to do better as a threat intelligence community to make sure that our defenders and our threat hunters and the folks that are on the ground defending networks have as much as they need um, to do the job well. This means that uh, the group could uh you know if 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 the group develops or changes tooling um it could cause the group to fall off those defenders radar or even completely miss out um on other aspects of the main part of the threat actors campaign like for instance the trickbot group there was a period of time when the trickbot malware was not being seen deployed to new victims uh so we saw public reports that the trick bot group was taken down. Um, and I had I had folks coming to me um, that I've worked with previously to, during response efforts that involved trick bot um, telling me that they were safe and they didn't have to do anything else. Um, but honestly, that's not really how this works, right? Uh, this can confuse investigators and defenders alike if they've never been uh, privy to what that tool looks like um, because trick bot, among other access as a service platforms are known to sell access to victims. Most of the time it's for the purpose of deploying ransomware. So we have to be very careful as um, security professionals when we're talking about uh, tooling versus the threat groups themselves. Or, you know, let's just say, just, you know, maybe one day uh, that the tool that the group is named after is actually being used in different missions by different threat actors, right? So this brings me to my next slide. Uh, let me introduce you to the Cobalt Group. Um, now, we'll get into what Cobalt Strike is a little bit later on in this talk, but this group has really always confused me. And I see a ton of different threat actors on a daily basis. And um, so when the first news reports hit, um, it outlined that this group leveraged a lot of spear phishing campaigns to drop Cobalt Strike payloads for backdoor access when uh, they were trying to move through financially uh, or move through financial organizations um, and institutions to commit some financially motivated crimes, right? Uh, so it got even better when I did a little bit more digging uh, because. I found out that they were using Cobalt Strike and like it confused me even more because that wasn't even a custom tool. Um, so it wasn't even like custom to them. Uh, so I just got very confused. And I remember reading through the blog, like the blog that outlined everything and got confused when they were talking about the group or talking about the malware specifically. And then that's just like, as a defender, you never want that to happen. And as a someone who authors papers and stuff, like I wouldn't want my readers to be confused when they're reading a paper, especially against something that's very, very, very important here. Um, so uh, I, 
it's just it's just very funny to me. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, this got even better when in mid 2020, uh, uh, the Cobalt Group reportedly refactored their tool set, uh, moving further away from even using Cobalt Strike. I don't know. Uh, I just I, I found it funny. Okay, hey, my name is Giggs. Like, it's gonna happen. Okay. Um, and then, of course, I'm not even going to start in on the Carbonac malware versus the Carbonac group. Uh, once it's safe to get back into large conferences, I'll see you guys at the bar if you're allowed. And we can chat about my vehement dislike that this had ever existed. Um, so basically, the biggest takeaway here is to just stop calling new threat groups by their tool names. OK, just like stop. Now, if you're confused by the explanation of a report that you're reading, try to find additional resources um, or reports to validate it, because the more data, the better. So this uh, seems to be a really important clarification these days. Um, I am here to remind you that ransomware has operators. Uh, so it goes a little bit like this, more and more, uh, we're seeing ransomware variants uh, impacting victims operating through what we know is, as a affiliate model. Um, what this means is that the main code maintainer licenses out their ransomware uh, malware samples to affiliates to perform their operations, aka deploying their ransomware. And then the, the maintainers take a cut of the ransomware payment. So maybe it's not sufficient to ask um, of the environment, are we safe from Soda Nikiti or dark side, right? Um, because uh, I know that attribution matters really does uh, cause a point of contention within the Twitter sphere. Um, but realistically, it does matter so much for defenders because you want to stay one step ahead of the threat actors as much as possible. They're already collaborating uh, more efficiently, apparently, than we are. Um, as defenders, and we want to make sure that everyone knows that threat actors use tools, right, um, to to come uh, complete their mission. It's the trade craft and the TTPs that really matter. That's what we're hunting for. That's the goal um, to find them before they have completed their mission. Hopefully, we'll catch them in the very early stages of their mission um, when they are trying to establish their foothold, so that we, um, you know, kind of avoid any any additional risk, right? That is that is the goal. That's where we're at. Now, understanding threat groups and what they target uh, can help you address business risk. Um, so as you're reading through your threat blogs, identify if your organization is even a target of these campaigns. It will help you define the level of effort you're going through. Um, you're going to throw behind creating your hunts. Um, basically, do you even have the technology that just disclosed a vulnerability that is being actively exploited? Or maybe you have customers or partners that could be impacted by this new campaign, right? That might open up your organization to additional risk. Uh, do you even have data to pivot off of, right? We'll identify in a blog um, here later some additional indicators of compromise that uh, we um, can search for, but we have to have a way to search for it throughout our environment. And we have to have a stable way that's repeatable because we're going to eventually automate our hunts. Um, so if you've answered yes to any of these questions, then you're going to want to move really quickly. And then maybe consider shutting off those uh, potentially impacted assets, you know, if another network appliance zero day comes out, because uh, a lot of them have been used to deploy ransomware within environments. I mean, we are still in 2021, you know, um, think about those. Think about just think about it. It's kind of scary. Now, if you're lucky and you have answered no to those questions, uh, you should still be doing those hunts, but you can take a more gradual and like casual approach to it, right? Um, so understanding that, uh, understanding how to read and interpret those threat blogs for your organization can really help quell anxieties of executive leadership. So if you don't have that appliance that's being targeted, you're not really a target, right? So take all of the other follow on actions that are in the report and action on those, make detections, understand whether or not you have visibility to see if those um, actions are taken within your environment, if someone does get access to your perimeter. Um, breaches are going to happen, but honestly, nothing is going to get done if we're all panicking, you know? 
Uh, one other big topic that seems very timely to discuss is, uh, oh, is <laughs> understanding the timing of campaigns. For example, detection can be a really big, uh, can play a really big role, but acting on those detections is really where the money is. Initial point of compromise to completion of the mission for uh, ransomware has been as quick as a couple of hours. Uh, so that doesn't leave a lot of room if you're unprepared, right? All right, so a little bit ago, we were talking about the wild theories that Swifties can create if they haven't heard from Taylor Swift in a while. So remember this picture? Let's just all make an agreement right now that we will never let our threat hunts get so far down into a, uh, a rabbit hole that we'll get here, okay? Now, in order for us to get to the main goal of our hunts, let's talk about generating a good threat hunt. Let's start with this. We have to capitalize on the core principles of what is considered a, a successful hunt within our organization. That is something you need to define within your team, but here are some things to keep in mind. First, we want that actionable intelligence. That way we can identify unknowns and create new detections for things that are happening in the wild and are being reported on. These hunts will give us a better understanding of where our gaps are, and then we will be able to later work to close them down and create new detections to better find evil. Through this, we'll be able to also provide a lot of data to show what's working and what's not working and pivot through to make sure that we are continuously getting better. Um, and to do that, we're going to validate that we have uh, relevant indicators uh, throughout our environment to make sure that we have all of the visibility that we need um, and what we're looking for, right? Then of course, we're going to anticipate that these things will change and make sure that there is a plan for improvement, both security controls wise, as well as those detections. Once those are put into place, verify, uh, we're able to see those indicators, right? Um, then we wanna make sure that we have measurable metrics, making sure that we have something to show uh, that we're working through a number of tasks and have a way to show that we're increasing the efficiency and the way that those uh, that are looking at uh, those detections um, can work through them in a more uh, uh, succinct pattern. And lastly, make sure that you're able to communicate those findings to the security community um, because that's a huge goal, right? Uh, figuring out what works and what doesn't, um, if you're able to, of course, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Uh, so if I've learned anything from Ms. Taylor Swift over the years, it's about understanding your worth, um, not only so that you can get paid for what uh, you have contributed in the environment um, and in the community, but also understand that um, you can inspire the rest of your team to reach higher peaks. Now, uh, we have... Uh, now that we have what it takes to make up a good hunt, let's dive into this uh, hypothesis genera uh, generation, right? Um, there are a ton of ways to approach threat hunting. Um, one of them being proactive structured hunts where you're looking at TDPs. Um, something that might be help helpful for you is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, and uh, maybe though, you are more better, you are more equipped to take on a methodical approach um, to do some unstructured uh, alert based detections um, and hunts, uh, right, to pivot on interesting points that are happening within your environment. Uh, so you guys are probably thinking, all right, are we out of the woods yet? Uh, so honestly, I'm a bit of a nerd and I need to track things down on like pen and paper. Uh, so this is how we're gonna be going through and, and keeping notes for uh, the rest of this talk. So we'll keep track of everything um, for the days, we'll grab IOCs, we'll put them here, we'll keep track of next steps. Um, and of course, we're gonna make a note of what the goal is that we're looking for. So things to keep in mind, making sure that you're acting or you're asking um, some structured yet broad questions of the data will allow you to let the data do the talking instead of your biases. Uh, and then making sure that you know, you have the data that you need to get a reasonable understanding of what is happening within the environment is super important as well. So making sure that you have those proper data sets. And then of course, making sure that you have that standard practice of uh, updating your procedures, creating better detections, and putting them all in play. Um, so with that all in mind, let's go ahead and pull out some, uh, rip apart a blog and see if we can come up with some structured hunts.
All right, so we're gonna start with this uh, FireEye blog from May, uh, where it is looking at all of the different uncategorized or unk groups leveraging the dark side ransomware. So here we see that dark side is a ransomware as a service, which again, basically means that the main code uh, maintainer is, is uh, licensing out that ransomware malware for a portion of the ransom payment. Um, and then here we see some host base indicators that we can use to verify um, the visibility that we have within the network. Um, and the instance, or for instance, here we see um, some file names. So we would wanna make sure that we're able to go across all of the hosts within our environment and list out all of the file metadata to check what those file names are. Um, and then making sure that we can ascertain when it was created on disk, um, what have you. Uh, but then also we see up here, there are some persistent mechanisms. Um, so we're gonna wanna check those, uh, but in this case, it looks like it is just pulling up the ransom note, um, but that is a me me uh, methodology-based detection that you're gonna wanna uh, figure out is weird service uh, creation within your environment, right? So then at the end of the blog, we see some host-based indicators. Um, there's some network-based indicators, IP addresses, domain names. Um, and then at the end of this, we see a MD5 hash for a beacon sample. Um, so let's go ahead and search that in VirusTotal. Awesome. Don't upload anything to VirusTotal. Just don't do it. Um, <laughs> just honestly, just don't do it. Uh, so here we see that people are, uh, you know, there are a bunch of different vendors that are detecting it as cobalt strike. Let's go ahead and look at the relations. Um, and of course we see that, yep, it is a cobalt strike beacon. Um, all right, so what the heck is cobalt? What the heck is beacon, right? Um, so let's talk through what cobalt strike is. Cobalt strike was originally created as an adversary emulation tool that's often used by red teamers to perform red team engagements. Um, and, uh, it also, unfortunately, is used by a slew of threat actors to conduct a lot of financially motivated uh, ransomware attacks um, and other uh, incidents as well. So things to keep in mind when you see that Cobalt Strike payloads have made their way into the network or into a blog is that the threat actor had to get those payments or those payloads in somehow. So something like a phishing email or other unauthorized access like um, password reuse compromises or zero day exploitations, you know, the list goes on and on. Cobalt Strike pre, uh, provides a fully featured backdoor that allows the threat actor to access a victim system with malicious payloads. Um, and it can be in memory only, or maybe the malicious payload is configured to run as a persistent task or service that will, that's written to disk and we can find it on disk if it's still available. Um, this provides the threat actor access to the system much like an employee would have access, right? They can run commands, snoop around the network, and move to different systems, right? It's just really a bad time. Oh, and to top it all off, decent threat actors will be able to evade detection. Uh, so they uh, will scoot around all of the detections that are using signature-based detections um, by bringing in custom payloads or simply turning off antivirus or other security tools within the environment. It's just fabulous. Um, so with that information, we can craft a lot of different missions uh, for our hunt on Cobalt Strike within the environment. Cobalt Strike is a massive tool, so go ahead and look at uh, the all of the documents for it. It's pretty snazzy from a red teaming perspective, uh, from a defender's perspective, not so much, <laughs> honestly. Um, so first we have to take a look at all of the indicators that are um, provided in the blog. <clears throat> um, and one of those being this host-based indicator um, that uh, is a payload, right? So generally speaking, uh, Cobalt Strike is going to be represented on a host as some obfuscated PowerShell. Um, so one of the hunts that you could do is looking through, you know, historical PowerShell logging or active process commands through real-time alerting, right? If you don't know about it already, PowerShell has a lot of logging and it's only getting better. Shout out to the Microsoft team. Thank you so much. Um, we really love to see it on the Defender side. Um, if you own a environment, please turn on PowerShell logging and beef up that, uh, that event log retention. 
uh, so that we can go through and comb through all of this stuff. So this is Cobalt Strike um, decoded, and this brings me to CyberChef. CyberChef is amazing. Um, after we fully decode this PowerShell, um, we see that there's a named pipe. So that's something else that we can hunt for um, when we get to network-based indicators. Um, so I see that we're running low on time because I decided to chat a little bit too much. Um, but uh, basically here is what I would write down for this uh, host-based hunt, right? Um, I would look through all of the uh, HBIs that are listed in that, um, that blog, but then also uh, I pulled out some example methodologies here. Uh, basically those uh, obfuscated PowerShell uh, queries, misplaced system binaries, uh, those system binaries calling outbound. Go ahead and look those up. Those are your pieces of homework. Um, so we can cruise right through here. Um, next we're talking about you know our network-based indicators here. Um, we can look for network-based callouts using um, our DNS logs. Uh, so making sure that you're logging DNS first is the first step. Um, and then you can kind of go through and stack like custom URI, uh, URIs, right? Uh, you can see a bunch of different post requests and stack those and see what is kind of what is anomalies within your environment. You can also hunt through stack, uh, hunt through and stack your user agents because uh, Cobalt Strike conveniently allows you to set custom user agents. Um, so Go ahead and do that. Uh, it's pretty nifty um, because honestly, the last thing that I want to cover, um, which is pretty pretty difficult to understand sometimes, and it's also pretty difficult to detect, is this uh, domain here. So one thing that concerns me over uh, as a defender is that this has Azure in the top level domain. Um, so if you know anything about uh, the way uh, Azure works, this is actually a domain that can be fronted um, and uh, FireTotal doesn't really give us a lot of information because it is a legitimate domain. Um, but because it was in our blog, we can we know that it is uh, bad, right? We know that it's it was used in a malicious fashion. Um, so the way that the attacker did that was they fronted the domain. They leveraged a um, they they basically abused the way that a content del content delivery network is configured. Um, basically, the content delivery network is there to load balance um, a very uh, heavily utilized domain back to a bunch of different servers. So a threat actor can essentially front that domain and say and, and tell the payload that instead of using the actual domain and getting picked up by that uh, that uh, actual content delivery network, it can uh, be configured to call back directly to the attacker owned infrastructure. Um, now keep in mind, content delivery network um, fronting essentially is used a lot to subvert censorship. So we can't just get rid of it um, because there are pros and cons to each, um, but it can be really difficult to understand because of how network traffic is often configured to be uh, recorded within your environment. So our hypothesis generation here um, really is uh, going to be searching for those indicators historically, and then also looking through and making sure that we have visibility into those DNS requests and making sure that we're able to see whether or not those uh, these indicators specifically are um, able and, or are showing up um, in our environment, because that probably will mean that we have to go back and do a little bit more of a deeper dive into those systems specifically that they're calling out from. Now, let's see. Um, so keep in mind that during your threat hunt, you are going to get a lot of false positives. Rome was not built in a day. Threat hunting is a marathon. You have to have fun with it. You have to accept that you're gonna be wrong. It's okay. You will learn so much by being wrong. Just make it part of your brand to constantly learn from your mistakes. Um, but also make it measurable, right? We're not just out here getting into bunny holes. Um, because the more skills that you're picking up, the better hunts you're going to have, which means you're going to be generating better detections and finding more evils with it, more evil within your environment. Um, hunt early, hunt often. Uh, this makes it less of a stress on the sock. Um, and honestly, sometimes you can find pre-ransomware activities and that's just like solid. If you can thwart threat actors uh, mission right before they end it, like that's money. So as we wrap up here, um, uh, 
let's go with uh, this kind of summary page. I talked about a lot of different things, so let's just recap it. Uh, Taylor Swift, she is a mastermind of Easter eggs and hidden messages. Uh, the data will tell us anything that we like want to know, even if it's wrong. Um, and then also make sure that you're sanity checking and making sure that you're creating better questions each time you're asking questions of the data. Um, and after you get through this cycle, make sure that you are able to validate uh, validate the signatures, validate the visibility, validate your detections, making sure that you're constantly having this feedback loop. Um, hunt early, hunt often, just do it. Honestly, it's going to be so much fun for you and you're going to be a lot better as a, de uh, as a detection, an uh, detection writer as well as an analyst specifically. Um, and of course, you're already here at this conference, so just keep learning. Those threat actors are doing it. Um, so honestly, why shouldn't we? Right. All right. I think I made it. I rushed through the end of it, but it's OK. Um, so I know that uh, you all probably have questions. Um, I don't know that we have enough time to do it, uh, answer those questions now. But I do want to give a huge shout out to the conference organizers, all of the volunteers, all of the tech support staff. Like y'all have been amazing. I had a fabulous time. I was enchanted to meet everyone here. Um, and I want to give a lot of special thanks to my colleagues who just like beefed up this uh, this talk to um, roll through a lot of Twitter and get a lot of buzz. It's amazing. It's such a great talk to have out there to learn how to critically think and and read through all of those tech uh, tech blogs to make sure that we're actively hunting. So with that, I will say, are there any questions, Ariana? I don't know if we have time. Hello, hello, thank you so, so much. I think we don't have many questions. There's a lot of discussion going on in the chat. So now, <laughs> there you go, thanks, Jared. Perfect. So in the chat, you've got these few precious minutes with Kirsty, everyone, so like, go ahead. Uh, thanks, appreciated, but uh, any questions? How else can we reach you, Kirsty? Uh, now we've run out of time today, but how can we get in, yes. keep in touch and keep the conversation going? Yes, if you are on uh, the Diana Initiative's uh, Slack, please feel free to DM me. Um, I will be hanging around uh, either the rest of today and um, also tomorrow. Um, and then of course, follow me on Twitter. I'm gigs underscore security. Always happy to have conversations there. My DMs are not open, um, but if I get enough folks that want to DM me, I will open them for a little bit, but that's always an interesting situation. <laughs> okay, I think all that is left now is for me to say thank you again. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise. Fantastic yeah. talk. And in the chat here, everyone, everyone watching, we've got uh, speaker surveys. So please, if you have liked this talk, please let us know. Give us some feedback. Feedback is good for Kirsty. Feedback is good for us here at Diana Initiative. Uh, take the minute or two that, that you can. That We'd really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsty. Bye, everyone. Bye.